Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Commentary is Magic's stream for Deck Discourse here on August 6, 2017. I am, as always, Grand Paws. I am Emperor Bugle. Big Cheese. All right, Cat. It's been a heck of a weekend or a couple of weeks of regionals. Yes, it yeah. Has. I hear there were a couple of decks that saw play at some places. There were a few. A Guys. Few. F FYI, you know, that many hot wings will give you heartburn. You should, I, you might want to, you know, just be careful. lay off a bit. Yeah. 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 But isn't that their one purpose? You can't handle all that spice. And the memes begin already, or the puns, rather. It has been a lot of fun, though. And we've definitely seen some strong decks come forth for the meta in a variety of archetypes. But today is a great chance to talk about one of our favorite archetypes, or one of my favorite archetypes anyway, and one of the most hotly debated, and that is Compa. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about aggro. How is aggro debated? Everybody loves aggro. It's too fast. The game's over so fast you can't enjoy it anymore. Well, I suppose that's true. Still, today we have a pair of decks in the combo archetype to talk about, one of which is still legal to play, and the other of which might not be as legal anymore. Well, 42 of the 45 cards are legal. Okay. It'll, it'll totally still work. It's it, gonna yes. work. Yes, it's gonna work. <laughs> it's gonna work. I know it's gonna work. But this is a great chance to highlight why some decks stick around, um, even if they're similar to other decks where cards have been have been banned, um, and what combo means overall for this meta. So uh, I think we can go ahead and introduce the stars of um of these two decks ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Okay, so we're we're just going to leave it at that because, and also I apologize for nothing. I mean, we've got a pair of lovely ladies here showcasing a couple of decks. Actually, no, I do apologize for the headphones. That was slightly excessive. It was a bit loud, I think. Yeah, you you, you got to jam the the pillar ponies theme though. Yeah. Now look, it's not you're not playing right into the danger zone. That's that's fair. Unless you're vapor trail, but we'll talk about that shortly. <laughs> so let's get started with the uh, the main offender from this last weekend, uh, a deck called One Purpose, or if you prefer, we get it, you vape. 
Uh, it, interesting choice of words, main offender there, in that she, unwi- you know, Twilight is unwillingly dragged into all of these contests that, and then it's like Favorite Trails running around going, you, me, let's hoof wrestle. Only you're not hoof wrestling me, you're hoof wrestling this alicorn princess behind me. And just in case you thought it was optional, no, Vapor Trail is a mandatory trigger. And you only have one character at home. That's not Vapor Trail. I mean, it might be Gyro. Uh, sure. M- maybe you made a mistake. <laughs> so, one purpose is a showdown-focused combo deck that relies on the premier Twilight main to enable you to cycle through your deck multiple times um, flipping more and more cards in face-offs, which you are continually winning. And thanks to Twilight's boosted ability, whenever you flip an event during a face-off, if that event would be put on the bottom of your deck at the end of the face-off, you can put that event into your hand instead, if you want. And that happens no matter how many events you actually ended up flipping. So I think the final count was something like 34 event cards in the deck. I mean, everyone's deck was a little bit different. But yes, more than two-thirds. So, Vapor Trail, obviously, was the key card here. Showdowns like Hoof Wrestling, uh, Magic Duel, and Fashion Week, of course, normally specify only friends can become involved. And Vapor Trail kind of lets or let you cheat around that and get Twilight involved when she should have had nothing to do with this in the first place. Twilight hates fashion and hoof wrestling and um, magic duels. Okay, maybe not that one. She kind of likes magic duels. She, she does kind of like the magic duels. But with such a high frequency of events, you were almost guaranteed uh, to flip into something that would allow you to play another showdown or play a showdown from your discard pile again or draw some additional cards, or whatever you would need to. And Premier Twilight had one of those keywords that we just don't see anymore, which is studious. So as these showdowns would continue to be played, not only would you be adding additional cards to your hand, and that's not drawing them. You're not drawing those flipped cards. Right. Uh, So you can bypass any deep darknesses your opponent uh, played against you. And pile. And pile. And pile, yeah. You're also gaining action tokens throughout this, and in the case of Magic Duel, you're actually getting two action tokens. And because you're only really using two characters for the entire face-off, there's not that many moving pieces. It's mostly go through your deck once, get your flips until the end of the turn, thanks to Sisterhood, and find the purpose in your life up to about four or so. Um, Yeah. Cycle your deck again, go through it again, play Fashion Week six times because you've got the ability to return cards of your discard pile to your hand with the spectacle and heart strong as horses. And then do it one more time and play Fashion Week another six times and there's your 15 points. Yeah. And in case your opponent is being cagey and doesn't play any friends, you give them one. Like because you're just... That's what good friends do, is they give each other friends. Yeah. Here, have this present. That's what you wanted, right? Everyone always wanted Screwball. So, uh, one purpose relies on so few specific cards to function that it is able to utilize multiple deck slots to protect itself and help overcome threats that would be present in the meta. Um, And one of the best examples of this is bats. I don't think even vote, uh, or even the vote, rivals the level of protection that bats provided this deck. I mean... Can't leave play. Right. Your friends simply cannot leave play until the end of the turn. Sure, they can frighten your friend, but the friend isn't the problem, it's your main. (laughs) Or... So you just pay the two to rally, and you're good to go. Right, and because you've got the studious that's there on Twilight, you're winning that face-off because Vapor Trail only has the one power. All your power is concentrated on Twilight, thanks to the fixer events that will last throughout the phase. 
Yeah, and there's no point in time where you can frighten Vapor Trail before she brings Twilight into the face-off. Because that uh, happens immediately. Well, once the showdown has been played. Right, once the showdown's been played. Right. So Twilight would remain involved even if Vapor Trail somehow goes away. And because of this, even in a meta where there are a large number of removal cards, uh, Belly Flop is incredibly common. Um, and nap kicks can still be very, very strong as well. You never really had to worry about that. Yeah. The only thing you really had to worry about was misfire, really. Well, and I guess cleaning up. But and, that's what hoof wrestling's for. Right. Uh, hoof wrestling provided actually a large amount of utility because it would be ideally the first face off you'd want to play as you're starting going through your combo for the first time. And it would also be the showdown that you would want to keep in your hand after or before you juggling routine so that you can play it as soon as you've juggled. And the reason for this is if you play Hoof Wrestling first and your opponent has a Magical Misfire in their hand, they are forced to choose. They can either play the Magical Misfire immediately and get rid of one of your showdowns and a couple fixer events that you're likely never going to play again. Maybe they might hit a Sisterhood. Or they can hold on to it and you're likely going to win the face-off because you're flipping additional cards and Twilight's up to at least five power and Vapor Trail's there and you only need to start a showdown against an opposing character who has one power. And you just kind of say, okay, I won the Hoof Wrestling, now I'm going to put your Magical Misfire on top of your deck and you've lost your opportunity to play it. Sure, it's a six, but again, you're flipping so many cards and you, so Twilight many. is so big, you don't care that they're flipping a high number. Yeah, because so after cards. the first one, uh, Twilight is generally seven power. Yeah. yeah. At least seven power, yeah. You might end up even playing into... Might be nine if you needed to fix three times. Yeah. Right. And then even other cards that can present uh, problems in this meta, like Sorin, for example. Luna's Future is restrictionless removal for a single turn. And there's almost no better option than that. Yeah, you only with... care about one turn. Right. Most in, of the time. Most of the time. Yeah, in one turn kill combo decks like this, you don't need to worry about hard removal quite as much. You just need ways to temporarily shut off things. For example, you don't need to worry about trying to run um, Snips and Snails to replace your opponent's problem, number one, because you've got bats, and if you try to activate Snips and Snails when you've played bats, you're going to have a bad time. Um, but number two, because you just need to temporarily shut off an equalist propaganda if you're going to try to run, if you're going to try to win. Right. Uh, Changeling Mimics, for example. Um, Nightmare Star will allow you to shut off Changeling Mimics because it's an epic, and so it's going to replace Changeling Mimics when it uncovers. Though so not until the turn after... Well, I mean, you get rid of the Mimics, but Mimics' effect lasts until your next turn. So you, you do have to wait one more turn, but you've given yourself that window. Yes, exactly. And even your problem deck is structured to allow you to get incredible value if your opponent has been moving through your problem deck. On the case, gets you 2 AT whenever the opponent starts a face-off. And it's 10 showdown, power. Right. Spell Showdown might as well just say, get an extra card every turn. Well, it's two-thirds chance. Two-thirds chance, draw a card. Extra, yeah. Very strong. Uh, halfway so across many events. Extra, yeah, just it's it's ridiculous the sheer number of events that are present in this deck because you really didn't need that much. And of course, Gyro will allow you to find whatever you did need. And did, the single did we talk about how how awesome Nightmare Star is yet? Nightmare Star is real good yeah. for dealing with with the mimics. So my my favorite thing here actually is uh, the answer to Limestone Pie, which is. Your main is not flipped, so Limestone can't target your main. And before you try to go off, you just Luna's future Limestone, and now she's gone, and you don't care. Yep. Although, as we've known, the, um, the fact that Twilight isn't flipped until the turn that you're actually going off proves to be a bit of an obstacle when dealing with at least one card, um, and a couple cards in particular. Uh, some of the tax style effects can get frustrating. Spoons. Uh, spoons is frustrating. 
stack of suitcases is a little frustrating uh, because you generally have to play a fixer event to get Twilight up to three power, which is going to make your Bats or Luna's future cost at least one additional AT. And chances are you had to gyro for it. <laughs> right. And then, of course, uneven ground yeah. would normally be completely fine to deal with in purple because you just nap kicks it. But because you don't have the purple requirement to play that normally, unless you've made a changeling token thanks to infiltrate into Hive, that proves to be a relatively large obstacle. Yeah. And I think that fact was a, a bit overemphasized in this meta just because of how easy a transition it was for all the players who were running Hot Wings to say, well, I'll just include on eating ground in my deck. And as a result, it was artificially... Like, its presence was artificially high. That that card was evil. And Evilest we'll talk more, card ever. We'll talk more about that later. But the key problem here with, um, with One Purpose is it was very fast in terms of what you needed to be able to go off AT-wise and card-wise. Theoretically, you could go off turn two that you weren't very likely to. No. Turn um, turn four or five was far more likely. Right. Because you need two AT to fix Twilight to get four power. Well, five power, but you know you need four for Vapor Trail, and then two for Vapor Trail, and then zero for Showdowns. And then you just kind of get lucky yeah. on the flips. Right. But typically you would want to play Bats or purpose first so you start flipping two cards instead of just one you mean sisterhood sisterhood yes yeah yes. it's yeah. always better to play sisterhood um to get the flips than it is to save an at to draw yep absolutely and all that being said the biggest reason that vapor is no longer with us Rip in pieces is because of what this meant for the opponent. And again, we're going to talk more about that later. But even though this deck was incredibly consistent and had answers to almost every obstacle that it could end up coming across, it still took a rather significant amount of time for the deck to close out the game within that one turn. Not nearly as long as, as One Pace did. Uh, but, you know, it took 10, 15 minutes to go through the full, the full thing, especially as you were explaining it to players. And if you are an opponent who's sitting there looking at, you know, belly flop or nap cakes or, you know, portal or things like that in your hand and recognizing that your opponents play to bats and there's nothing you can do to interact with them, but you still have to sit there and flip cards for these face-offs, it gets pretty discouraging. Right, maybe you flip something with chaos, or oh, I I mean again, not not much chaos matters. My I had one opponent flip two of the one cost rarities, which and it's meant she had to banish her own stuff, but she still had other friends for me to hit. Yep, frozen magicite will slow it for a turn. Or, well, or I mean, take two at to move it back home. Sure. Ma or uh, yes, Pro yeah, because it'll move Twilight up to. A it'll problem. move Twilight, yeah, yeah. But again, nothing that's really going to be a permanent disruption with the protection tools that you have down, and especially not with, uh, you know, you you are basically leaving your opponent almost no window to play those cards since you've got the hoof wrestlings anyway. So if they do end up drawing one off of the juggling routine, okay, well they have to use it right then and there. Right there, and. Like, even if they are lucky and draw um, Magical Misfire, and they go, okay, I will get rid of one of your juggles. Now you only have one juggle left. That's not true, because there are four ways to get juggle out of the discard. And you right. only need to juggle uh, th two or three times? Yeah, yeah, two or three times. Yeah, you only need to go through the deck three times. Because the last time you can just well, set it up with your it's fashion three times. only. It's not, sometimes you don't have the luxury of playing every fashion week, every loop. Usually yeah, you do, true. but... Not yeah, it's really only the yeah. first time through that you might have any issues, but... Once you're once the deck is empty once, or effectively devoid of all non-event cards, or devoid of all event cards, you're pretty much made. Yeah. 
and it's a lot faster at that point for the opponent because it cycles very quickly. Well, once there's sure, 14... it's faster at that point, but like getting there is torturous. Yes, yeah, completely agreed. The the last two minutes, it's like saying there's two minutes left doesn't matter if it took ten minutes to get there. Like, right. To, to quote Apple Bloom, I want it now. Yeah. And that is why I think we'd say we're all glad to see Vapor Trail gone. Every one of us here has played this deck. And many of us performed well with this. But it's just, it, it doesn't create a fun play experience for the opponent. It's not good to see these kinds of interactions that are sticking around where the opponent has to has to wait for an extended period of time. And again, we'll talk about that here at the end of the stream. But yeah, yeah, I believe this, people described it as uh, being hijacked, you know, Shanghai. You're, you're there, you're along for the ride, but you don't want to be. You're just kind of forced to participate. Right, exactly. So this is an example of how combo can go wrong. It's very consistent. It has answers to almost every disruption tool that's out there in the meta. I say almost. Um, and it doesn't require that many cards to be able to go off. So you can dedicate a lot of your deck towards just making it more and more efficient. And, of course, your opponent is... Uh, the game does not immediately end. It takes a an incredibly long period of time, relatively speaking. Again, not as long as right. combos back in the day, but still, you don't want to be sitting there waiting for that long. So with that in mind, now that we've seen combo go wrong, let's take a look at another perhaps more well-known combo that's present since DOE has released and how combo can go I'm not going to call it right, but maybe not as wrong. Fragileer. Fragile. I mean, it, 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 it's not nearly as problematic. Let's put it that way. Sure. So, Apple Turnover, or the full name, Apple Turnover My Deck, attempts to use the probably the most well-known combo interaction from DOE, which is Mod Pie Counteroffer with Princess Big Mac. Hello, and... I would like to flip my entire deck, please. No. That wasn't deadpan enough. That's true. There was still emotion Good point. in your voice when you were I'm saying sorry. that. Hello, you don't get another shot. I would like to flip nope. my entire nope. deck, please. You don't get another shot. Too late. One shot. Minus. One shot. Yeah, one shot. One shot. That that that's like two years ago. <laughs> no, that's yeah. three years ago. It was eh, a good year. Whatever. Uh geez, tell us a little bit about this deck and why why we're seeing some of the cards that we are here. Well, it's another showdown deck. Although it doesn't actually have to use showdowns. Uh but the main thing here is the obvious interaction of um mod and Mac where if you, as soon as you flip a single card, you get to flip your whole deck. If Mac's involved. Yeah, if sure. Mac is involved. Um, so, do you want to explain that interaction a little bit more for, for Railer and for other people who may not be aware of how that works? Oh, okay. Um, so, Mod says... I forget the exact wording here. But uh, when you flip a card during a face-off, uh, you may put a plus one ca power counter onto one of your friends. And Big Mac says, um, immediate, uh, when this card is involved in a face-off, you may remove a counter. Ooh, someone did that. Let's see. Um, yeah, you may remove a plus one power counter from this card to flip an additional card. So as soon you flip a card, so Big Mac is involved in a face-off. You flip your initial card. You say, okay, well, mod... Uh, gets to put a plus one power counter on somebody, I'm going to put that on Big Mac. Oh, look, Big Mac has a plus one counter on it. I'm going to remove it. Flip another card. Mod says put one on. Repeat. 
Um, and this, they, there are passing priorities in here, but it is just keep flipping cards. And every time you flip a Chaos card, it does stop, and you have to process the trigger on the Chaos. Uh, but... And there is some Chaos in this deck. And there is. A little bit. One or two. Yeah. The, the important ones... Uh, the most important one, actually, is uh, Discord Wrathful. Uh, flicker a friend. Or, yeah, I think it's Flicker any friend. Um, yes. yes. This is... Basically, it gets you readies, and more importantly, it also lets you uh, bounce Coloratura. Not Coloratura, sorry. Coco Pamel. That's her name. Uh, and Coco... Well, and the first time you choose someone else... Uh, depending on depending on how you enter the combo. I'll, I'll get to that. Fair. Um, okay. Uh, so, when you bounce Coco... Um, Flicker. You, yes, because bounce is returned to hand. We've got to remember these terminologies here. Uh, so when you flicker Coco, it allows you to put a car, a, an event from your discard pile into a like side hand that you can play from. And it doesn't matter what happens to Coco, you can always play that card. And this allows you to recur Fashion Week. So you play Fashion Week, flip a card, flip every card, and then during that, you get a Wrathful, so you bounce Coco. Oh, look, Fashion Week is back in my fake hand. So that's what gives you the infant Fashion Weeks. Um, the other things you would flip with Wrathful is if you use Lotus Blossom, uh, who is uh, face-off, retire this card to put a, f a friend from your discard pile into play here, um, banish it at the end of the face-off. Close. You have to banish Lotus Blossom to do that. Oh, and banish this card, and then yeah. Yeah, and it is still location based, though. Yeah, and uh, so that would not be fun to just like, oh, well, I have to banish Big Mac. So you bounce him, not bounce him, sorry, flicker him. Now he's no longer the Big Mac that put was put into play. He's a different Big Mac, or mod, whichever one you brought back. Uh, yeah, because you can bring bring back either. Yeah, yeah, and then you know redeeming qualities because no one wants to pay five to play mod. Um, Apple Bloom because no one wants to pay three to play redeeming qualities. Uh, right, and generally and, you're all generally you're always going to be bringing back mod with Lotus Blossom because you need to start the face off involving Big Mac. Yeah. So bringing back Big Mac with Lotus Blossom, unfortunately, doesn't accomplish a whole lot other than giving you a duplicate, which sometimes is worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the other cards we've got here, we've got some cards to flip, um, Muffin Mare, but but really, why Muffin Mare? How how's the combo card? Well. The showdowns require you to find an opponent with equal or greater power, and Big Mac's got four, which is kind of hard to hit. Well, this so happens, uh, Muffin Mare, for the low cost of 1 AT, can increase um, the power of any friend, including opponent's friends, by exhausting another uh, character, which you could exhaust Mod, or Muffin Mare, or anything or else Big you Mac. have out. Yeah. Like, you're flipping your deck. You don't need his power. Exactly. So that's the whole reason she's there. It's the cheapest, most reliable way to uh, get, the, get an opponent's friend boosted. Additionally, where many people tried looking at this list and saying mod cost five, we definitely need to reanimate her some way, um, and tried to go an Apple Vendor route, trying to flip Apple Vendor is a lot trickier because you've got to invest more AT, and then she'll only flip at the end of your turn, so you have to do that before you actually are going to go off, so you have to kind of set up a turn in advance. And Muffin Mare has the ability to actually, if you choose, not require you to play any of your own cards to flip her. You can just move her to a location where your opponent has a character with three power. Yeah. And like, that'll just do it. Like your opponent's running Bluna? Uh, probably gonna move up the flip. Just, just predict which card, which uh, problem is gonna be. Well, especially could be either problem because Boom is probably gonna move. So. Yep. And so because of that ease of flipping the main and the fact that it removes a lot of the cards that would normally be required in the deck, like oh, um, any of the power fixing events or join the herd, or things like that that would boost characters' power so that you can challenge them. 
you've kind of got the whole thing in one package here. You know, we're kind of seeing a theme between these two decks of trying to minimize the number of cards that are actually required to get the combo to work so that you can save extra spots for protection and anti-disruption. And one purpose certainly did that a lot better than this one did, but even yeah. this deck tries to find efficiency wherever it can. Yeah, this one is the minimum cards is both Big Mac and Mod, and then one of either Hoof Wrestling or Fashion Week. Now, if I had those, I generally still would not go off, um, because you need protection, you need a little bit of AT buffer, um, but not, not as much as, well, this uh, one purpose, if you started to go off, you had no idea if you would actually make it, unless you just had a ton of AT. This one, if you have the minimum number of AT, and your opponent doesn't do anything, you are guaranteed to go off. So you have an a exact number that you need. Especially if you have protection through things like Changeling Throne or Appaloosa in play, where you don't have to worry about opposing chaos effects, and your opponent can't force you to, or can't dismiss your friends or even frighten them, then you really don't care shy of immediate banishment, which is basically only a chaos effect, and Changeling Throne takes care of that. I mean, there's Portal. I mean, Portal doesn't sure. really matter. Portal does. Portal does cool. matter. If you portal Big Mac, he's not involved anymore. Yeah, but now Portal's gone, and I mean, it can matter a little. But I mean, if you have another f showdown, then no, it doesn't matter at all. But if you didn't, then yeah. Now the the important thing to kind of point out here is that you will likely end up with additional power counters that you can distribute among your characters short of just the one uh, from flipping you know, one card at a time and then spending it. Because number one, Big Mac has Diligent, and you're going to win that face-off. And number two, you've got other Big, other big Macs you might be flipping. I highly recommend not and, putting... And Moon Dancers. Those, right. I highly recommend not putting those counters on Big Mac himself simply because that will require additional uses of Muffin Mare. Yeah. Well, you can just spend them all at the end of a face-off anyway. I mean, You can spend you them anytime you want, actually. I it's think. true. The, no, you can't. Gonna... He does say, in a face-off, it says during us a face-off? Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it says during a face-off. But this yeah, is also important. End. Yeah. This is also important because you do generally want to leave one extra counter on him. And the reason you want to leave one counter on him at the end, which can easily be the diligent counter, is so you can actually flip the first card for the face-off before your opponent gets a chance to flip their card. Yeah, so you flip everything, and then they flip a card. And that will protect you from the unseen chaos effects. And of course, Aloysius is in there just to give you a little bit of extra AT. And as someone did point out in the chat, because you flipped every card for your entire deck, one of the rules is when you end a face-off and you put flip cards on the bottom, you can put every card you've flipped on the bottom of your deck in any order that you choose. Well, you've flipped your entire deck, so you can reorder your entire deck, every single card, in whatever order you want. Even though very few of them are actually going to matter. But that does this... mean that, you know, she's, as you were saying, you can go off with just Big Mac mod and a showdown. Yeah. You don't even need the Coco Pamel in hand. Yeah, because you can just like, uh, you can put Fashion Week and Coco on top of your deck and draw them. You'll need more AT, but. Yeah, two more. But yeah. The two AT that Owl Witches will give you. So there you go. So yeah. two decks, each using Showdown. Ara, tell us a little bit about why this particular interaction is less scary. I don't know. To me, it's still pretty scary. Well, sure. Like, it's still going to present an opportunity for one turn kill. But compared to, like, one purpose. There's a few major differences here, right? And anyone, anyone feel free to chime in. The biggest one that I see is the amount of AT that you need to actually go off in this deck and retain the same or close to the same levels of protection compared to one purpose is monumentally more. Yeah, I yeah it, it's a lot higher mm. to go off. Um, your protection is 
like Appaloosa costs two instead of bats costing one. Uh, Changeling Throne costs two. You you don't have protection against everything. A uh, magical misfire can actually stop you if played at the correct time. Like like uh, trying to put that mod into play, right? Well, what if there is no mod and you already played the showdown? And it's like, oh, well, that's kind of unfortunate. Or like I said before, portaling Big Mac, like after they put mod into play, now they can't flip their entire deck. And unless they flipped Discord off of that one card, mod's going to be banished. Now they need to find another mod. There, it, This is a lot more vulnerable. Yeah, multiple points of disruption like you're talking about. Also, it's uh, aside from the flip, it goes a lot faster. Or aside from the, the fact that the opponent must flip one card, I should say. You can effectively say, I'm in a loop. This is what I'm doing every time. You get to flip one card to see if it's chaos matters. Sure, though, I guess I'd argue that that doesn't differ much from one purpose. No, but the, you get to turn your deck over. Yeah, which you is fine, but you still have to interact with the opponent. And they're still sure. sitting there going, okay, great, lovely. The The main difference, it, though, is that you, in one purpose, you have this big, the, the drawdown phase, or the flip-down phase, or whatever we want to call right, it. Right, which is unknown. Which Yeah, which you can totally fail. Uh, on this one, as soon as you I did it your... on 21 AT twice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on Apple Turnover, if you flip your deck once, you, you've got it. Like, unless the opponent plays something, there's nothing, there, there's no question. That amount of time saving is actually relatively impactful in terms of cards that enable interactions like these sticking around. It's not the only thing that does, and again, we're going to talk about that here shortly. But it definitely comes into consideration, because if a game is just going to immediately end one way or the other, you know, like you're talking about, you either have it or you don't, there's not that question, then that is a lot less taxing to play against multiple times. Because the game either ends very, very quickly, and then you can move on and play the next game, or you... You stop to them, and you right. get to keep... And you get to, you get to keep playing and try to win, or they have to try and find the combo again. And combo decks don't usually get an opportunity to try twice. They can. It happens, but it's not frequent. Right. Depending on what you did to disable it, um, they could have spent all their resources just to have all basically all of it taken away. So... Go big or go home. That's the combo philosophy. Basically. So this gives us a look at a couple of, of combo decks that can exist or have existed within this meta. But there's been a lot of discussion about combo for, honestly, the last few years. And that's not surprising. It's kind of unexpected to see in a game like MLP. Maybe not so much now. Uh, just because we've had, you know, kind of a track record over multiple years of seeing these decks pop up here and there. But a lot of players have very strong opinions about these. And I think that some of those uh, opinions are definitely coming from a place of frustration. And I absolutely understand that. But I think there's also some misconceptions. And I'd like to take an opportunity here to try to share uh, my thoughts and experiences and have the rest of, of Sim share their thoughts and experiences um, and clear up some of that. This is also the, uh, the chat participation phase? Yes. This is where we would love for chat to, uh, if, if you have an opinion about this, uh, if you see something that we're going to be talking about, please share your thoughts with us. Yes, Kirsten. We won't is, bite, probably. This is, this is a main event here. So the question really becomes combo, is it healthy or is it a hazard to the game? And I think the first thing 
that we have to look at is this wonderful picture of rainbow shine and then go back to the presentation. You Thank you. The... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank definitely. you very much. I had to move IRC. That's okay. So it's not evil. At, at the you, core, you said that too quietly. I, I did, because I don't want to just go into the whole song or we'll never get this thing done. <laughs> so let's look at, at the game, right? There are a number of different ways you can play the MLP CCG. You can play aggro. You can play farming. You can play control with cards like Ursa Vanquisher. Cards are going disappearing? What? <laughs> they are disappearing. There we go. And the last way you can kind of play this game is with combo. Uh, combo is just what we refer to as an archetype. It's a way to play the game. It's another strategy, but it's using the same cards that everyone else has access to. And it's using some of them in more unique or novel ways, or perhaps unexpected ways but you're still playing the same game. So fundamentally, with those cards being available to everyone, it can't be some you know, unspeakable sin to play the game with the tools that have been provided to everybody. But that doesn't mean that it's always going to be fun. Are we having technical issues? No, everything is perfectly fine. I don't believe you. I think he's a changeling. We should all run. A changeling would say someone else is a changeling. So Raylor asks the question, when making a deck, should you ask yourself, will this upset my opponent? And I don't think that is a question that you can honestly sit there and ask like that, because upset, um, or, or is this going to be fun for my opponent? Fun and happiness are kind of subjective. Some people are going to like playing against certain types of decks. Other people are not. So yeah, if you, so if you happen are... to get played... Uh, sorry, go ahead, Beagle. Yeah, I was going to say, there are people out there who hate playing against aggro decks. They find it incredibly insufferable. They want to play against anything but aggro. This might surprise some people, because aggro is probably the most popular archetype by far. But there are some people who do not enjoy playing against it. And th this is true for all four archetypes. There are people who hate playing against farm. There are people who hate playing against control. And there's, like, I think one person who hates playing against combo. Yeah, just one. Just one. And I think, actually, during these, these discussions about this deck, I think I've seen all of these viewpoints. People were complaining about farm and control and aggro. Like, and obviously combo. Sure. But no, somebody, somebody somewhere hates the archetype you're playing. And granted, this is going to be a lot more rare with aggro, but I know one of my local players does not like playing against aggro and has never liked it and, quite frankly, looks at hot wings and goes, that's disgusting. Why? I mean, it, I mean, it kind of is. But. I mean, it, it kind, Hot Wings is kind of disgusting, especially if you eat, like, a hundred of them. Because I had a rumbly in my tummy that only Hot Wings could satisfy. <laughs> Did you cook them up and eat them? Yes, I cooked them up and eat them. Um, but when you're dealing with a control player who just wants to, like, see their control go online and the aggro constantly wins before they can get any of their tools out and start doing anything that gets frustrating real fast well i guess that brings up the question um i'm reading the, the uh, comments right now how do you define a fair solid controlling match what does that mean well we'll, we'll talk about that as we go a little bit if deeper, it so. ends 14 okay. to 15 that's yeah. a fair match not not 15 to 0 with my opponent not having flipped their main no. That, that's not fair? That's I not mean, fair. Maybe? <laughs> yeah. Depends. Well, I mean, no, if, no if, if it was, was upset with me earlier I mean, today. the best kind no. of match is well, zero to zero conceded before the game started. 
Well, well, you know, if your main is Cadence, then I don't know why you expected to flip it to begin with. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. I flipped the Cadence against you. <laughs> I know. Using... <laughs> anyway. Um... So, then the question becomes, if playing combo is really at its core just another archetype, and we're not talking like these individual toxic interactions, we're talking combo as a concept. Finding kind of a, a non-intuitive way to reach your 15 points and win the game or force the opponent to be unable to reach 15 points and win the game. Then the question becomes, why is there so much drama surrounding combo as an archetype? And there are three main reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is that Combo is surprising. Um, the interactions that are that are present in it are relatively unknown and not immediately obvious, and that catches a lot of people off guard. Uh, the second is that many combo decks have a high degree of complexity. There's that stuff that's going on that you weren't really prepared to see, and you're not really sure how you're supposed to interact with it, or in some cases, even how it works. And that requires time to sit there and explain these cards and how they're being played. And then you feel kind of frustrated for, you know, maybe not recognizing it immediately. Um, and then the third way that it becomes uh, aggravating and, and discussed about in a negative manner is that it creates uh, NPEs or negative play experiences. And of these three main reasons for drama, um, the the one that's actually an issue is the negative play experiences. You can have surprising control decks and aggro decks and farming decks. Uh, you can have uh, decks that have incredible complexity, like toolbox control bugle. I have no idea what you are discussing. No, you can't do the the monotone now. We're past the mod deck. Mm -hmm. Um, but these negative play experiences are where combo really does become an issue. Um, and while it's not limited exclusively to combo, um, it's definitely more common. We can go to the next slide. So what we need to look at is these, these NPEs, these negative play experiences. And it's important to stress that this is more than just, um, something being unfun, because as we said earlier, fun is subjective. Ara, you were talking about people who didn't like playing against Hot Wings, despite the fact that like 30% of the decks we saw at regionals were Hot Wings. We have people who don't like playing against farming. I don't like playing against grindy control sometimes, even though I've run grindy control before. And there, there are a lot of people like that. They like playing an archetype, but hate playing against that same archetype. It it may be hypocritical, but they embrace it. That's how they play the game. Right. So what we're defining as negative play experiences are situations where one or both players become frustrated with the game that's being played. This is more than just not having fun because you don't like the matchup. There's something actively going on here that is aggravating. Uh, you might even call it tilting. You You might be... You might play worse in future games just because your experience in that one game was so unenjoyable and, would, and just rattled you. Would you say they might be peeved? Bugle such language. language. I, I, I'm sorry. So there's a, a, a very common situation that comes up in certain combo matchups, or I should say has come up in certain combo matchups before in decks that have run cards that are now frequently banned. And that is that uh, they often result in a player being forced into a very difficult decision. They can either participate in the game for an extended period of time without any meaningful choices, or they can concede. And one purpose is kind of the perfect example of that, in that you're not going to reach 15 points immediately. 
you know, you kind of have to get through. But you, you know, are kind of sitting there with your combo in hand and asking your opponent if they if they want you to stop. And if they say no, you keep going and you keep playing cards. And they're forced to sit there and flip one card and flip one card and knowing that nothing's really going to have an impact. And there are uh, three root causes to this in a combo deck. But we'll, we'll wait till we get a little bit further on the slide here. Uh, and those three causes are going to be uh, that your opponent just didn't include any answers in their deck, um, that your combo deck includes disruption prevention, or that your opponent has had past experiences with combo decks as well. And I think, I think we'll look at these here. So let's go to the next slide. And Aura, can you tell us a little bit about including answers in your deck? And not just for combo in general. I mean, you include I need answers in your combo decks, right? Uh, you try you to, but then you get DQ'd from the tournament for having an illegal deck. Okay, so packing answers into your deck, everyone knows some of the cardinal rules. You pack resource removal. You need it. If you don't pack it, your opponent's going to land a study session, and then you are going to be the sad. Combo decks tend tend to rely on something occasionally stuff in the discard so there's lots of purple things that you can deal with here you can blow up friends you can you know just take your pick really you can scare stuff too too i'm sitting here eating candy delicious candy better than eating salt spoons spoons And then obviously there's a lot that falls under the umbrella of utility, right? Taxing effects are definitely utility type control, but you've also got things like hand disruption. Discard disruption. Discard pile disruption. Um, harsh judge? I don't know sure. what that counts yeah, as. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, harsh judge. Um, things that can shut off abilities. Yeah, sure. There's a lot. If we just sit here trying to list them all, we'll be here for a while. <laughs> right. Yeah, but... part, and, and this is part of the metagame, is knowing what kind of things you should be putting in your deck to deal with whatever screwy thing your opponent's up to. Some things are more general. Some things are more specific. A lot of the more general things might even be a good idea to just kind of run... Our, our slides have gotten ahead of us now. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm aware. Are. And yeah, I'm just going to claim technical difficulties here, and I'm not even running this. Someone said harsh judge. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, the the key here is if you're not including answers in your deck to begin with, then you're just playing single-minded whatever it happens to be, and you are not going to have great success. The card pool is large enough to where people are including cards that will interact with you in a number of different ways. And if you are not preparing for that interaction or needing to interact with your opponent, then it's just not going to perform well. Part of the reason that Hot Wings was built the way it was is because it runs multiple pieces of hard and soft removal. Without that, if it was just blue pink and just for multiple ran, types say, of cards, right, exactly. And if it if it just ran, say, more wildfires and you know, uh, more more cost reduction through things like two bits, and didn't bother to include things like belly flops or the very punch and orange swirls or things like that, it would not be nearly as good as what it does as it is. Yeah, there, there's a term for these kind of decks. It's the glass cannon, which uh, is so named because it has quite a punch, but if you throw a rock at it, it crumbles and can't do anything. Just no one should ever run belly flops 
or food fights or jerk or faces jerk or faces. drinking duos or yes, yes, yes. Now, that being said, just because your opponent is running answers does not mean that you as a combo player aren't also coming prepared for those. And that is where the second uh, source of negative play experiences can be provided. Just like your opponent can tech against you, you can tech against your opponent, and the war kind of goes back and forth. So combo decks will generally have some options available here. Bugle will tell us about those. But we already have them all on the slide. Well, okay, no. Uh, so yeah, so... The first thing is protection. You have a combo. Usually the combo by itself is frail. If it is disrupted at all, you basically just say, GG, my opponent's won. So you need to protect your combo somehow. Uh, ideally, you can protect it by the opponent just, or going off when your opponent has zero AT, but most players are savvy enough now to hold up AT for removal or whatever. So just you just one try and protect it. Yeah. Uh, Another another way is, uh, as we mentioned, harsh judge. If you are expecting a specific answer, you could uh, protect against that specific answer. If you think they're going to nap cakes, just play harsh judge and say nap cakes. Now, that was the only thing in your hand that you could do, so now you can't do anything. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, then there's redundancy, backup options, or searching, or whatever. Like... One purpose needed a uh, sisterhood to go off, usually. If you didn't have a sisterhood in your hand, but you had a gyro, you could pay one to find a sisterhood and then pay one for the sisterhood, which is almost as good as just playing the sisterhood. And, of course, uh, there's the ability to just be really, 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 really turn three fast. And your opponent hasn't even started playing the game. They have, like, two cards in play. They scored a point and you're already done. Yep. That's let's not go, fun. No, it's not. Uh, let's go to the next slide so we can talk about the, the third main source of negative play experiences. And those are actually past experiences. It's like our impressions of things are shaped by what we've already seen or something. Shocking, I know. The us of today w was formed from the us of yesterday. Yeah. Yay, so, one pace. Yay, yay, one pace. So, take two radically different combo decks, for example. Take one pace and then take pie eating contest. One pace being kind of the first combo deck that came out and showed out in the meta and actually got played for a period of time. Um, and took an extremely long time to actually finish its games. Um, and then take Pie Eating Contest, which is relatively recent, was just kind of debuted earlier this year, and unlike One Pace, does not take a long period of time to close out the game, because once it does its thing, that's it. The game is over because you're using loops. Now, a, a person who has played against One Pace, and, a person, a, and that same person playing against Pie Eating Contest, even though those decks are different fundamentally. The impression of playing against combo or, or this kind of uh, uncommon archetype in general might be the same. So even though one of these decks is going to force your opponent to sit there for 20 minutes as you hope your showdowns cooperate, and the other is going to sit there and say, I loot party favor and burst of speed, your opponent's impression of the newer deck might be soured by their previous experience. As time has gone on, combos have gotten uh, more and more ways that they can kind of uh, shortcut themselves within the rules by just looping the same action over and over again, as long as there's no variance. But that doesn't mean that that was always the case. Even very fast decks like Dragon Express still had variants that they had to account for, and that meant having yes. to go through the actions. And that was fast uh, turn-wise, not time-wise. Right. So those are the three main sources of negative play experiences, which we know are the big problem with combo in general, but of course can also apply to other archetypes too. This is 
this is kind of a universal concept, these negative play experiences. Right. They're just... They aren't restricted to combo. They are just frequently... Uh, they are experienced, I would say, more frequently against combo. Yes, I, I think that would be that would be true. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and Bugle, then, why don't you tell us about, well, why does combo still exist? What, what makes a combo okay to exist and, and stick around? Well, there are uh, two reasons, typically. Well, I guess, I guess not two reasons. There, there are two, con two things a combo deck needs to be okay. Uh, the first is it needs to be it, it, it needs to be fragile-ish. But there needs to be some way for the opponent to interact with you. Um, if you've played bats and now they can't do anything except maybe play a single misfire, that's a little, little bit too solid. But if there are multiple points of interaction, like we discussed with uh, Apple Turnover, where you can use a portal on the on the Big Mac or whatever. Like there were, I think we listed like four or five different ways to interact with that deck. That's the, more more decks can interact with it, which means more decks can beat it, which means it's not going to uh, just dominate and be awful. So and hmm? so, if I could break in here, one of the yep. the things here with this is also you don't want people when coming up with deck ideas to just like. Everything they come up with, they just feel that, oh, well, I don't have this specific card or like one of these two cards in my deck. So, well, right. then this deck is just unplayable. That's not what you want the, the game to feel like. Right. Like going back to old school one pace, it was like, do I have Mare in the Moon? If no, I can't play Friends. And that was awful. So you, you needed like one of two or three cards. But one purpose, there are many, many cards that you might already just be running anyway, not, not even needing to reach out for a specific answer. It's just you're going to run it in your deck anyway that can uh, interact with it. So it's a lot more fragile. There are more ways to stop it. And then the second way that is, uh, the second condition that needs to be present for a combo deck to be okay is a short cuttable loop. And what a short cuttable loop is, it's something with, uh, once you do it, you can do it infinite times, and it will do the exact same result every time. Um, so something like uh, like the uh, pie eating contest loop. There, there's no randomness. You don't shuffle any decks. You don't flip any cards. It The exact same ha steps happen in the same order every single time with the exact same result. So you can say, I do this, do you have any responses? And then they say, no. And then you say, okay, now I do that 5,000 times. Do you have any responses? Chances are they're still going to say no. So that's a short cuttable infinite loop as opposed to one purpose where you can't at any point do that because you have to flip random cards. Your opponent has to flip a random card. You have to shuffle both players' decks. And then you have to do it all over again and all over again. So having both of these things makes it a lot less miserable to play against. Because if a deck was fragile, but they still went off, then that was either, whoops, I didn't draw the right answer, or whoops, I forgot to include the right answer in my deck or whatever. But the answers existed, and that wasn't your fault. It, or, or rather, that wasn't the fault of the game just not providing a way to interact with it. It was either bad luck or a uh, deck decision that unfortunately uh, wound up not the way you wanted it to. Or the short cuttable infinite loop, which basically says, my combo is over. You don't have to sit here for 20 minutes flipping cards that you don't want to flip. You're not hijacked. Right. When we're talking about fragility, we're talking about a couple different things. Um, the, you might require uh, too much AT to be able to go off. Uh, you might require too many individual cards. The perfect example of this, oh, yeah. of, of, both of, these, of both of these actually, are like Coco Grissies, for example, which is just a nightmarish combo to understand so what's fun. going on. 
it's super fun to be able to go off with it. And it does create infinite loop situations, so that part is good. But it's just so fragile. Uh, and you need so much to go off. Uh, reliance on a particular zone, like keeping lots of cards in your hand, or lots of cards in your discard pile, or even lots of cards in play over multiple turns where your opponent can then interact with them. Um, and like we were talking about, multiple points of disruption. You know, one purpose didn't have this as much because it was basically just Vapor Trail and Twilight as far as friends, and everything else was just events. But decks like um, like the Apple Turnover, you know, have multiple friends that you can interact with. And they also have resources that if you can get rid of, now all of a sudden you can banish, you know, or, or dismiss Big Mac or Mod, and that's going to cause problems. And while it might sound strange that a, a shortcutable deck, something that can go infinite, is generally going to be healthier than something that can't, the key is you're wanting the game to end quickly. You want the deck to become binary. You know, Cheese, you were talking about how there's a magic number for Apple Turnover, right? Yeah. And once you get that magic number, if you have the cards, you either, you've got it. Like, there's no, there's no question. You have these cards unless your opponent does something to stop you. Yeah. And you will win the game. Yeah. And because of that, the game's going to move very quickly. Likewise, you're flipping your entire deck at once. So you're not having to individually flip seven cards and see which of those are events and which of those are not events and then put them on the bottom in different orders and all of that. You just kind of go, there's my deck. I've reordered it once, and now I will repeat this process 14 times. Let's see if your chaos flips mean anything. Yeah. Okay. So with that being said, Combo's been around for a while. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And there are some cards that have remained in this game that have enabled multiple combos and multiple combos that have done very well, and yet these cards are still legal. These are repeat offenders. So who wants to who wants to tackle this? I can I can cover some of it. Go for it. I'd well, like to draw my entire deck. <laughs> and except if I don't draw my deck, I get apps. Yeah. Oh, that seems that seems good. It does seem yeah. good. Seriously, these things have been around for what two years. There have been multiple combo decks with them. Just, Christ, that's all I'm gonna say. Best yeah. princess. Yeah, I mean, these are all these are all pretty old cards. Um, hence the repeat. Yeah, yeah, they can't. If it's a new card, it's harder to be a repeat offender. Well, see, you say that, though, but then there's this smug little jerk over here just smiling away at us. Yeah, that's that's still set three. three. Set three. He knows what he did. Well, so did Vapor Trailer. didn't stop her. Actually, he probably doesn't recognize that a problem has occurred. That's true. He is a horrible hipster. Probably he's never prob heard of his problems. Yeah, he's, he's probably never heard of the combo. Uh. So, geez, why then, why would these cards continue to be around? And, you know, are there other cards that people talk about as well? Well, so, Luna, like, there have been combo decks with her, but they've all been super fragile. Uh, Luna's expensive and has high requirement. And it's not just Luna you have to get out. It's also you have to manage to get all of the friends and all the draw. Um... And generally, if you can use Luna, it means you already have a draw engine, which is generally the, the more dangerous part. Right. And showdowns, while they've been used in kind of the same style of deck that don't necessarily loop themselves, actually do provide an interesting angle of play. Leo, I think you mentioned that you had a deck that you built just a week or so ago that was using Hoofrassling and Magic Duel and was doing so in a fair manner and wasn't trying to just create a one-turn kill combo. Exactly. The deck itself was looking at using the face-off cards for hand control. You play the uh, Hoofrassling to get a view at what the opponent's got in their hand, put something on top of the deck, Magic Duel it away. Completely fair, completely legal, and it's probably closer to the intended use than to abuse it. They weren't being replayed, and they weren't being... Yeah.
And Tringerhoof, while he hasn't been used as often as some of these other cards, he was used very frequently, or I'm sorry, very recently, in a pie-eating contest, but he's a two-power friend, and DOE just came out with a number of different ways to interact with those friends. Not to mention the fact that he also forces you to rely on your discard pile. Yeah. And that just provides so many opportunities for things to get screwed up. And even before DOE, I don't think anyone except for you and me ran Peck. No, I think you're right. I ran it. Come on. Well, no. At, like, yes, the, at... The at um, Babs. At Babscon. Yeah. And, and Tyler did as well. And Bugle sniped us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we returned the favor, though. Yes, so we it's, did. It's K. It's fair. All's fair in love and combo. Yeah, like, yeah especially now, Peck, uh, like, uh, yeah. I wouldn't play I, it. I did <laughs> say I was running the Destiny Drain. I just, I guess yeah. you guys forgot about the Nightmare Moons. No, saying you're running it and doing it, eh, whatever. Not okay. a time for that discussion. Fine, fine, fine. But there are other cards that people talk about as well, Cheese. What are the, what are the two other big ones that we hear about? Oh, uh, yeah, recent. Well, actually, for a long time now, um, deck resets, uh, Juggle and Changeling Infiltrator. Um, uh, they have been parts of combos, um, but not all. Like I like Piting Contest doesn't even run uh, either of those, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah Piting Contest, contest does doesn't one step didn't. And um, there's a few others. Yeah, and then Apple Turnover doesn't. Yep. Um, so they are enablers, but they also have use outside of it. It is, um, I think, Ara, you had your description of a, a different way to word juggle. Uh, basically, what if it instead just said, like, banish the discard pile? Well, so juggle had uses back in Canto the Cantalot era, or even later than that before we had magical misfire. So here's what Juggle says if you want to take it and turn it into something that can't be used for combo. It's still a, what is it, three power, two pink rec, one cost, yeah, or what, whatever it is. Anyway, yeah, the, the card text instead says, banish all cards from both your and your opponent's discard piles. Draw a card. Yeah. And that's how it was used. Uh... A bit when mod yeah, is prevalent. I, yeah, yeah. You're dealing with mod. I don't want mod, mod to be to seven three, power. And she's sad. You play a, you play one of these things, and she goes back to three power. And yeah, and it's it's also really useful against um, like there there are some builds of hot wings that would want to run it if you're in a um, friend dismissal heavy meta, or it's just you need more ammo. There there are decks that will go through their entire deck, and the game will only be half over, and they'll be sad like what what happened right sure like, another great another great example of one that's not super obvious is decks that have uh, very specific key cards that they absolutely must have to be able to function and have no other method of recursion uh, after gen con last year we actually right. updated waking nightmare to include two copies of changeling infiltrator just to be able to get dr hooves back if we needed to right if the opponent actually uh food fought all of your hooves and they were just sitting there in the discard and you're going well now i'm flipping randomly and there's nothing i can do and my chaos control deck doesn't work because i can't control with my chaos well you you chaotically control sometimes you do sometimes you don't you don't know anymore uh, we, we want one kind of chaos not meta chaos right. those cards also work really well with cadence everlasting love once you burn no, through don't. all of three copies, then you juggle in routine and you can burn through more. No, they don't. <laughs> they work amazingly well with Cadence. Nothing no, they works don't. with Cadence. <laughs> Only Cadence did one thing right, and that was get hasty on a friend so she could go in hot wings. <laughs> <sighs> Everlasting love is a wonderful, wonderful card. The, the, the pink-white one is very strong. That's yeah. Everlasting love. Yeah. yeah. I think they thought they were talking about the main. No, we oh. Oh, okay. no yeah, no, we we ran that in they, some other deck, but they just know I love Cadence. Yeah, Octavia. Yeah, which o is Octavia why Octavia Pink ran Everlasting Love a lot, right. and it which still does. Burn... <laughs> which is why we're burning on her. Okay. Yeah. So, so well, what Rayler just was saying, 
Uh, yeah, sometimes variance just just makes you lose. It happens. You cannot base the entire performance of a deck based on one or two individual experiences. And let's actually go to the next slide, because that's really what we're going to be talking about here, is a common question we saw related to the Vapor Trail banning, which was, well, wait a second, I beat this combo. Why did it get banned? And it's important to recognize a couple things. Let's take a trip back in time here, back to Canterlot Knights. One one pace is out. Dang it, Starlight. We're going to do the time loop again, or time warp again. Sorry. These cards, Plum Tuckered Out, the Soup Incident, things like these, these were really your best anti combo cards that you had at the time. Plum Tuckered Out basically said to one pace, I'm going to try to slow you down for a turn, and that's the best I can do. Because yeah. you just didn't have ways of interacting with your opponent outside of your own turn. At least not in meaningful ways for combo. And the suit mitzvah was just about the best option that existed for dealing with Dragon Express, but it was four rec in yellow. And that Nobody was... runs yellow. Yeah, it, it was Crystal Games. Ballroom Blitz had already fallen out of favor. So... You did not have meaningful ways to be able to interact. Let's take a look at some of the cards, just, just a sample of some of the cards that we've seen in this most recent block, the, the EO block. Right? We've got cards like Magical Misfire, which can banish an entire discard pile outside of your turn and then replace itself in your hand. We've got Changeling Mimics. Thanks for that, Bugle. Uh, You're welcome. We've got Rarity Soprano who, uh, you know, Vendillion clicks a good card in Magic, why wouldn't it be a good card in Ponies? And the answer is it's an even better card in Ponies because it's in the wrong colors. Uh, <laughs> also, yeah. also, you discard instead of put on bottom. Right. Uh, Limestone Pie was just printed in DOE and can shut off abilities of even main characters outside of your own turn. Rainbow Dash on even ground will shut down any deck that likes saving up AT, whether it's combo or not. Belly Flop is probably the single best removal we have in the game right now. These are just a sample of some of the multiple ways that you can interact with your opponent outside of your own turn now. And because of that, it is important to recognize that combo will likely never reach the point it was previously, where there were no meaningful ways to interact with it. Because we have cards now in this meta, not just in this meta, but in, in the game and the card pool, that are good playable cards. They're not like Soup Incident where you're crippling yourself by including it in your deck. That will allow you to interact in just about every facet of this game. AT generation, cards in hand, cards in discard pile, friends in play, abilities, paying more, whatever you want. And so to say, oh, well, I beat this particular deck when I played against it. It can't be that bad. Well, again, geez, you're mentioning variance, right? Yeah. So never things aren't always going to perform like you need them to. Sometimes you're going to get the magical Christmas time hand when you're playing, uh, you know, hot wings and have like three angel wings in your opening hand, and just kind of laugh. It it happens. It happened on Thursday. <laughs> it's great where you go. Turn one, DFO with Night Glider. Two, turn two, DFO with Night... Or not turn one. Turn two, DFO with Night Glider. Now, you can do it turn one, can't you? Yeah, you can. Yeah, turn one, DFO with Night Glider. Turn two, DFO with Night Glider. Turn three, DFO with Night Glider. Like, it, it's rare, but it'll happen. It Likewise, can happen. <laughs> it's also rare that you will have 21 AT and draw and not be able to find a vapor trail. But it happens. It does. And so what's important to look at since there are so many cards that can interact with these combos now, and just other decks in general, is are there an incredibly finite number of them that will be meaningful, or that this combo deck in question does not include answers to? And if so, if you do not include those answers, do you basically just lose? And the answer in some cases is yes. You know, we're in, we're in a meta right now where uh, blue is very prevalent, and so it was very easy for some players to be able to shift and to include some on grounds in their deck after they saw one purpose that was out there. And that's one of the few cards that really couldn't be interacted with, just because we don't have things that would allow us to do that without color requirement. 
at least not in a great way. You almost did it, Cheese. It was pretty close. Almost. Uh, but yeah. I ran into one of those, and my response was, "I'm. I don't see a good way to get out of this." Yeah. But if you hadn't run into uneven ground, there wasn't that much that really mattered. Yeah. Not, it was not with. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's in it's in Seattle, like it was it was on even ground. Uh that hurt. Like people had other answers, um, but they just weren't enough. Sure, exactly, Cursed Chords. There are some people out there who don't want to be forced to play blue. And that's when you can tell that a combo is not going to be healthy. When you know, you look you look at other card games and you look at metas where it's been you either play this deck or you play the answer to this deck. And almost inevitably, that situation ends in a ban. And the same thing ended like, up happening. Like Ravager here. from Magic. Right, exactly. The Mirrodin block was uh, atrocious. So you look at this exact same situation, right? You either ran on even ground in your deck, or you hoped that the combo just suffered variance. If you didn't or have you... on even ground, there were answers for almost every other card situation. Or you ran the combo. Right, or you ran the combo. And that's not good for the meta. Two decks does not a meta make. We're looking at you, AD Era. We're looking at you. So, you're, we're never going to reach a point where combo is going to be as dominant as it was before, and that's a good thing. Um, because, that's a very good thing. Right, exactly. We are all combo players, and we are all saying we don't want a uh, combo winter to happen again. I mean, I'm okay with combo winter happening again, but I'm also not okay with the long-term effects of said combo winter happening again. Viz the game dying. Sure. And so, to help counter this, uh, to help avoid this situation where these uh, specifically toxic combo decks, not the ones that are, you know, more fragile or can loop and get things over with quickly, but the ones that are going to take a while and force the opponent to sit there, and the ones that have a lot of protection and you basically have to run one specific answer uh, and force you into playing that in the meta even if you didn't want to. Um, to avoid those situations, even the combo players have had a, a, sh a, a shift of mentality. And we can go to the next slide. And I think it's kind of important to talk about that. Ara uh, or, or Bugle or whoever wants to take lead on this. Especially because you can provide a little perspective of, you know, where we were last year. What is... Oh, it's so tiny. I can't read it. Lessons learned. It's, a, it's an amazing card. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Lessons. So... Uh, the the game's generally made up of uh, smaller localized metas. Um, you can go to different groups, uh, and you can see wildly different play styles. Now, generally, this happens. Uh, this regionals was a bit surprised. Well, it was yeah, it was actually kind of surprising how much hot wings there was. But um, there were also a lot of decks that were different between the the regionals. And so that can make it harder for things to spread um, if it's just seen locally. The Seattle local meta when the regionals aren't in play is possibly the weirdest thing ever. It's just lots of Sweetie Belle. So, so many much hats. Sweetie Belle. So many hats. So much hats. So much hats, so much Sweetie Belle. So Too many they... hats. The other thing we have is this is a, a much smaller player base than, say, uh, Magic. And so combos tend to stay hidden longer. Um, there aren't lots of groups um, just, like, so super competitive looking to try and, like, win, like, thousands of dollars and, and, or tens of thousands. Sitting there, and hammering events. away on the card list, looking for broken things that they can use to wreck the next event. There's... Us, I think. There's uh, th some other groups find things, um, but yeah, 
And it's just not it's not a ton of groups that are like, oh, well, let's go, let's go find all the combos. Right. And and that's specifically what we're talking about in this situation is not that there aren't competitive players in this game, but there aren't people out there actively hunting combos necessarily to the same level that you'd find in other CCGs. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people like that's not the fun part for them. Like that's a fun part for most of us. We just go, okay, now what what cards interact in a new and exciting way? And that's fun. F that, that's fun for me. I like that. I'm a Johnny. And I think most of us are Johnnies, but you are the worst not everyone kind of Johnny. is. The Johnny Spike. No, we are the worst kind of Johnnies, which are Johnny Spikes. If you're not familiar with Timmy, Johnny, and Spike, that's a very interesting lesson from the Magic community. And so... Oh, sorry. I'm go see if I can get a link to that article. All right. Sure. Yeah. And, and so we've, we've kind of changed how we've approached this. Um... I mentioned on Facebook that uh, combo crew is, is no more. That kind of that kind of died after after tant abuse, um, and it's mainly because of these reasons. Um, get more, get the decks out there, and try to create a more fun play experience. I would. Well, I I think it started to die when we actually found tant abuse because we went. We need to tell, we need to tell people about this. We just didn't tell the public. We only yeah. told the devs. Um, and that's the key shift here, right? Well, I think I think we had even told the devs about um, Penny. About, yeah, well, about all of the even the one pace and well, I don't know about one pace, but like but one, one pace step. we posted very publicly. Yeah, I think uh, like one step we even told the devs and stuff. Yes. And and that is something that we don't want people to. Um, to misconstrue here, we are talking about when we find these interactions because we hunt for them for hours at 3 a.m. At, yeah, at combo o'clock. It, it's combo o'clock. If you ever want to build a combo deck, it has to take place at about 2 o'clock in the morning. It's just the way it works. Um, something about your brain and just seeing things. But when we find interactions like one purpose, the very first thing we do after putting it together and seeing if it even remotely functions is... Right, because we need to make sure it works. Otherwise, if it doesn't work, then it's like, oh, that's not a problem. Right. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to waste their time. But the very first thing that we're going to do is let individuals through you know, the OP email address at Interplay know that, hey, you need to watch this. This is potentially problematic, and this could lead to a meta that is unfun for a lot of people. That alone, unfortunately, isn't enough. Not because people aren't going to believe, you know, the players who have who have built these combo decks and they've worked time and time again, but because the individuals who make these decisions have to provide justification to their superiors. You know, you can't just sit there when a card has been printed and gone out to hundreds or thousands of players across the world and there are so many copies of these cards out there in the meta and then say yeah we'll just ban this one because we've got a bad feeling about it you need you need solid evidence you need justification especially in a card game like ours where people uh can have real huge emotional uh ties to their favorite characters right there are people who really like vapor trail from that one episode you can't just go okay we printed a vapor trail card, but you can't have it. And she's the why? Well, that's the only vapor trail. Well, why can't trail, I right? have that? Yeah, she's the only vapor trail. But like people are going to go, why can't I have that? And they're going, they can't say, well, because some guys said that it is bad sometimes. That that's a really crappy reason, right? They they, was... they need they need things to point to and go that that is why Rain. you cannot have vapor trail. We are very sorry. We'll I try to shine. not do this again. Rainbow I mean, Shine. Yes, Rainbow Shine being one of the few exceptions to this because she constrained design space. And at the time had done nothing serious wrong. But you made her do something wrong. Once. Once. Using other banned cards. <laughs> so, and, so, and, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so yeah, this is, they need data. Once a card is printed, they 
need more than just a gut feeling. If it's still in playtesting, if this combo had been found in playtesting, and yes, it's very unfortunate that it wasn't, that's a completely different topic. But if it was found, then they could go, okay, uh, that's a good point. Maybe we should not do that. But when it's already printed, that's an entirely different matter. Right, exactly. Yes, uh, they do. Interplay does do playtesting. Playtesters, however, are humans. They're fallible. They don't see everything. Sometimes it takes some other random person in the community to look at something and go, hey, what happens if, and then all the playtesters simultaneously go, and right, yes. And like, how long was uh, Marks and Timeout before you found Peck? Almost a year. Yeah, yeah. a long time. Uh, so like, there, there was a lot of playtesting that went involved in uh, EO, and no playtester, zero people thought, hey, bulk biceps plus portal. That's good. It's in a different color. Why should we bother looking at that? Right. right. So uh, we make mistakes. Playtesters make mistakes. TCW, then, I, I, I will say that the, the quality of the playtesters is very high. And it is just difficult from a perspective of someone who does not have that interaction with, uh, with playtesting to know that there are probably multiple things that have been found in testing that never saw the light of day because they were stopped early. And so what we might view as, well, how did, you, how did you know, Big Mac or Mod get through? It's because there was something else that was like, whoa, hold on there, son. And stuff right. sneaks by. Right, you can't see the full picture. And so that is an important thing to keep in mind. Edwin brings up a good point, though. We need people to play test at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> this is possibly. This is true. Okay, some, someone tell Interplay this. This is clearly the next thing that needs to be done for their playtesting stuff. Sure. Midnight, caffeine-fueled. Now, we're talking about giving the game a helping hand and trying to, trying to focus on the long-term health of the game, right? Um, and creating this more satisfying play experience. There have been decisions made in the past, and they weren't wrong decisions because we're talking competitive play here, top-tier competitive play, national, continental competitive play, where interactions were kept under wraps from the general public until those you know, until such a time where it would be played to maximum effect. And lo and behold, it usually ends up working well, because how can anyone know to prepare for it, right? Yeah. But One pace, screw shot. Sure. Tant, tant abuse. abuse. Tant abuse, yeah, exactly. And it's important to recognize that while doing that is perfectly within the spirit of a competitive game, we're, you know, no player is under any obligation to share what they're actually doing. If you, do, if you choose to do so, it's simply by choice. If you don't, if that information isn't out there, with the groups being as, as uh, scattered as they are and the metas being as localized, there's very little chance for players to learn or to grow in their skill at playing the game. Because if they don't know that cards interact in these manners, if they don't see how toxic interactions can you know, be created, how do they know what they're supposed to do when they're facing down that situation? You know, it's too late to alter your deck at that point in time. And so the best thing to do is to increase the visibility and understanding of these combo decks. And not just combo decks, but just top tier competitive decks in general. You know, uh, we have multiple players who play through... Uh, who form these online connections to be able to play with people. And that provides a great chance for people on other ends of the country to play against each other and see styles of play they might not otherwise. And players, you might be surprised to see to see this, but some players are curious about how, how combo works and are even interested in learning this themselves, just because they might not necessarily have the the knowledge to be able to assemble these combos to begin with doesn't mean they can't run them yeah it going uh that we had uh several people who saw you playing that deck right and were like hey can you teach me right and again the the goal there 
was not just, I want to be able to learn how to play this, but also I recognize that the problem that Vapor Tail creates is one that needs to be addressed. And I want Enterplay to be able to notice this. You know, notice us, yeah, it, it, it was an effective way for them to have their voice be heard. And in situations like those, the best thing we can do is, is to share that knowledge and not to, not to restrict things. And so, you know, we've sat here and we've played, uh, you know, the, the Big Mac and the mod combo, the Apple turnover, and we've played one purpose. And um, I, I personally don't know of any other, you know, one turn kill combos or potentially toxic combo interactions in the cards that we have right now. Well, there's Pack. Yeah, but we know yeah, about that's Pack, not, and there's, yeah. a, there's a primer written on it. Yeah, right, right. There's I'm, nothing I'm else. We have we have talked about the ones that we know of. Yes, right. Yeah. We're not we're not holding anything back. This is this is an open policy that you as players will see from us, and this is kind of our our promise to you: is that if we find something like this, we will provide opportunities for you to be able to to see it and and learn about it and counter it and play against it. Because it's a more fun play experience when that happens. And it's a better long-term experience for the for the game. At least that's the stance that I that I take on it, and I believe it's shared by many of the people here. Yeah. We we could win more frequently by not talking to you, but then we wouldn't be talking to you, and that's sad. Like not not everything about Games is winning, as, as uh, a certain Vapor Trail meme has shown. It's um, <laughs> not about winning. It's about sending a message. But in basically any game I've played, right, there are, like, sure, there, there are games that I've won and had fun with, but there are a lot of games where I've lost or been completely shut out, and, like, that was, that was fun. I had a lot of fun with that. I would rather have more fun experiences than more winning experiences. Granted, I want to win Continentals. No, like, none of us are going to say we don't want to win Continentals. That, that's not what we're I saying. have to defend my title. <laughs> you won't. Ooh, <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's... Wow. Oh. Shots fired. You heard I'm it just here first? I'm just saying, his, historically, no one has won twice in, twice in a row. Oh, you're talking statistically, okay. Statistically, yeah. Yeah, that's that's different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. It'll happen. Don't, <laughs> don't you use fancy mathematics to muddle the issue. We'll we'll come up with something at combo <laughs> clock but, yeah. on Thursday. Or oh Friday. God. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, <laughs> the, the point is, we want the game to be more fun. And if that means giving up some of the advantage held by keeping information secret and then just springing it out at the last minute. So be it. it. Yeah, it's a sacrifice we're all willing to make. And we would encourage you to do the same thing, not just with combo, but you know, if you have the opportunity to play against people outside of your local area or to share information, we have seen such a dramatic growth in the online presence of this game over the last year alone through Skype, mm -hmm. through Discord, through Facebook, through online IRC. tournaments being run through Reddit, through IRC. You know, there's yeah. a number of different ways that you can connect. And I really encourage you to do so. It's a great experience. Yeah. Now, now we're not saying post your deck saying this is what I'm playing at Gen Con, everybody. Like you can do that, but you know, there, there there's definitely a reason uh, or a rationale to not say what you're running, right? I mean, we're not saying you have to publicly announce it. It'd but be if cool. you found interesting tech, share it, like uh, Critical Thought did with the uh, purple white deck that he brought to uh, my regionals. He shared that on the Reddit. And some people have gone, huh, a lot of that is interesting. And I have not thought about that before. That is what we're talking about. Ara says, share your deck and tell him what you're playing. I mean, you, you should do this because I'd like to know, but you obviously shouldn't do this because it would give people an advantage. I mean, yeah. feel free to. We're not going to tell you not to, but right. that, that's not what we're saying to do. But what we... Yes, and what we've done is, quite frankly, had we sat on pie-eating contest or... Or one purpose. Or one purpose, and rolled that out at Gen Con, is 
Is there any doubt in anyone's mind that that wouldn't have, at minimum, wrinkled the game up really badly? No. Absolutely if, would if have been. If one purpose had been saved until Gen Con, uh, it would be another chant of use. Like... And that's not being cocky. That's just, you know, calling it like it is. It's unexpected. It would have blindsided the field. Nobody, I think, would have been ready for that. And as a result of it wrecking regionals, it will now not wreck continentals. Right, well, that was... Like, it, it, no, ahead. yes, it did blind some people at regionals, but that wasn't uh, because we didn't talk about it, because we were talking about it. Yeah. Like, we mentioned Vapor Trail uh, in our uh, card retrospective, right? Yes, well, not we did. retrospective. Uh, analysis, card analysis. So, right. incidentally, think... called it five band. I... No, now she's a six. Eh. Six is banned. <laughs> I, I forget eh, what number okay. I gave her, but I'm pretty sure we all were saying uh, this five. is combo bait. Yeah, it's one or a five. Yeah. We may not have found it yet, but we, we got it eventually. It's there. It's somewhere. Right. And then it was. And we were playing the deck pretty frequently online within different circles. Like, a lot of people knew about this deck before it came to regionals. Yeah, it's it was like um it, it wasn't like there was a primer that was written in advance, but there was a reason for doing that, and that was it's difficult to recognize the threat and the toxic experience created by certain cards unless you actually see it in action, in the same way that Interplay can't justify a ban without having something to back it up. You know, you've got you've got to have some form of evidence. And regionals actually provided a fantastic opportunity to be able to do this because number one it was a relatively competitive environment so we're going to see some strong decks and large player turnout number two this is the first year that regionals was not a gate you know kind of a gate to getting into continentals continentals are open this year anyone who wants to go to gen con and play in continentals who bought tickets to gen con can do so so it's not like by playing Vapor Trail combo now, we took away the ability for people to, to play in Continentals. A couple buys, and that was it. I mean, and that's assuming that we would have like either not played or run Cadence Main if we hadn't have run uh, one purpose. <laughs> oh, just kick him while he's down, why don't you? Hey, I got second. I did well. You did. You did do very well. You almost, you almost had the uh, the mirror of our first game. Yes, almost, which would have been amazing. But it would have, yeah. been, it would have been epic. Well, I think I think we've uh, discussed this slide quite a bit. Uh, yes. Do we have you... anything in chat that people like? Have people said anything in chat? There have been some some things that we've discussed as they've come up. Okay. Cool. And. I think there's there's one last thing to keep in mind with as cards occasionally may get banned, um, they're going to a good place, and we can go. They to the know next what they did wrong. We can go to the next slide, the last slide. Uh, and we don't have to worry because all that's happening is is Rainbow Shine is getting more friends. And who doesn't want to have more friends? Everyone likes friends. Anti-social farming, that's what doesn't want more friends. <laughs> <laughs> Feathers. Fair point. Feathers doesn't want more friends. Twilight was so hopeful. Premier Twilight was like, finally, I don't have to play a farming deck. And then like Vapor Trail was forcibly like, you know, secret policed away. <laughs> Here. Participate in this hoof wrestling contest. What? But okay, now now Fashion Week. Huh? What? Yeah, have a magic duel against Trixie. Have another magic duel against Trixie. Go back to Fashion Dang. Week. Magic duel. <laughs> Vapor Trail had a. Uh, she needed to cut down on the sugar. Yeah. She knows what she did wrong. Anyway, I think that is a, a long winded but detailed explanation of, of combo in general. There are elements of it that are toxic, but as a whole, it's just another way to play the game. And if you know what you're looking for, 
and you understand kind of the philosophy behind it that even the combo players share now, I think you'll understand why we'd like to see some non-intuitive interactions continue to exist in the game. And I hope this encourages you to explore those options for yourself and to maybe look at things in a new light. And maybe you too can give Rainbow Shine new friends. Now, I, I want I want to see the memorial video for Vapor Trail again. <laughs> what what video? I don't know what you're talking about. You mean the memorial for for Rainbow Shine? Do we have a memorial for Rainbow Shine? <laughs> yes, we have a we have a thing for Rainbow Shine. Destroyer of Worlds. She did nothing wrong. Wasn't she like crawling out of the grave or something? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, that's yes, on that one. one of the bees primers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah it's the bees. Okay. Uh, TCW asks, "Is mod next?" Nap nah, Angel Wings. She's yeah. next on the list. Angel Wings is next on the list. Uh, just gonna. Go nah, we're just gonna go down the list of Wonderbolt applicants. Angel <laughs> Wings. Is Angel Wings is next because aggro is broken. No, we just need to aggro ban all be, of the Wonderbolts. Uh, aggro should be banned. No aggro. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting thing to me. I like. I think the four best pink blue cards, like both colors, are all Wonderbolts related. We have Soren, we have Spitfire, we have Angel Wings, and we have Wonderbolt Strap. Yeah. Wonderbolts.deck. As for for mod, um. And if you need more, add Thunderlane. Uh, yeah, I'm still not 100 percent sure what I feel about uh, Apple Turnover. I like that. That's one of those things. Like, I kind of need data. Yep. The list is out there now. We we'll need sure more pylons. I mean, yeah. data. We will. We what? will make sure that we post the deck list for this video on uh, Reddit and linked on Sims Facebook. And. If you feel like exploring that option on your own, please do so and start discussions about it. You know, that's how things like this get discovered and how you get more people to play them. Talk. Yes. Yes. Talk, uh, talk is important. The, the power of the spoken word can never be underestimated. That being said, or the written word, I guess, since yes. most of us are going to talk on uh, the internet, right. yes. typed word, whatever. Words. That being said, I'm not thoroughly convinced Mod needs a ban yet. Yeah, it's... There's a lot of moving pieces, there's a lot of AT, and it's pretty dang fragile. Which doesn't say the deck doesn't work, just... Oh, no. It's yeah, not it... It's not tier zero, oh, oh my god, or oppressive, or whatever. Right. Now, Angel Wings is not particularly broken, she's just very efficient. Yeah, we're, 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 we're poking fun at Angel Wings. Mostly. She did wrong things, but they're not combo wrong things. Yeah. It, basically, she just improves um, uh, Hot Wings by like a yeah. turn. Like, she. Or maybe two. In some I could see an argument where if she gets a little more out of hand, like, she would have to get Penny Lane uh, nuts to get a ban, and I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, and uh, she doesn't like. Well, Penny Lane doesn't shuffle the deck, but she doesn't have interactions that shuffle the deck, and no one's trying to run nine of her. Yeah, no one's trying to run nine of her yet. We're running six uh, Rutherfords now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to address Cursed's question of didn't we just spend the entire stream saying mods okay? Yeah, that's our impression right now. But again, that's something that data might you know adjust. In, you know, the actual performance of the deck might end up being radically different than what we thought. Right, right. Our current impression, um, and, based on, you know, ba based on what we know about making right. combo okay, which is that it's fragile and that it it, it loops infinitely. Right. Well, uh, not that it loops infinitely; that it has a, uh, short a short cuttable loop. Yeah, sorry, yeah. short cuttable loop. Um, it is our opinion right now that th this might change later. Uh, but it is our opinion right now that mod Mac is not uh, ban worthy. Yeah, I mean, you gotta look at. But we'll we'll see. Yeah, and like as we did, it's it's 
the the negative plays and just like win rates, kind of. Like you got to compare it against uh, even b back to the first first slides. Uh, it's just another way to play. Like. Yep. So. Uh, we really do appreciate you all sticking around for this stream, though it's it's been a long one, but there's been a lot that we wanted to cover. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say uh, congratulations to everyone who performed well at their regionals, and good luck to everyone participating in any regard at Gen Con, whether it be the main tournament, side events, whatever it happens to be. And Brony Con. And Brony Con. And Brony Can. And Brony Can. You all should go to Brony Can, every single one of you. Yeah, I hear Sim's going to be running stuff there. Yeah. I hear that's going to be pretty fun, and we get to do things like, like Team Seal, maybe. Oh man, do we have to hype that? We have to hype that three weeks in advance because it's three comps in a row, and we won't yeah. have time to <laughs> yep. any other time. Oh god. So, Ara, want to want to sound off with our presence at the various cons? I've lost track at this point. Okay, so BronyCon is going to be Bugle, Ara, and I. Uh, Gen Con. Ponk is going to be there. Yeah, Ponk is Ponk there. Is going there? And, okay. Yeah, Ponk is going to be there, and I think Feathers. Yeah, has... and Feathers is going to be there too. Right. And but no Skitter... Grand Paws. No, no Skitter. Skitter's not. Um, and then Gen Con is going to be everyone except for Feathers. And Brony. Because yeah, she has another commitment. Yeah, and Brony Can will be our. Uh... Oh, is Pinky going to? can i forget at this point i would assume not yeah so it'll be I maybe for a yeah bit. maybe our uh, me because i'm running events and uh feathers but i believe grandpa's and i will be uh commentating for brony can correct and grandpa's you are commentating for con? Brony con. yes that is correct uh and we do have uh a uh, critical thought and uh, furry flurry who commentated last year's Gen Con. They have volunteered to commentate this year's Gen Con, and I know a lot of people seem to think they did fairly well. So, yep. yeah, they're so they're back. <laughs> we are we are glad to be able to bring you a live stream from Gen Con of both days of the Continental Championships yeah. with, with commentary, not not just a stream with commentary with you live know, commentary because. Right. Commentary is is, is magic. magic. Uh, see what you did there. Q theme song. Uh, okay, look, play, look, play I... Pillarman. Go quick. No, <laughs> no. no. I, I like that we've been uh, just focusing on this uh, Rainbow Shine comic for like twenty minutes now. It's the best. <laughs> It's either that or the other Rainbow Shine. <laughs> anyway, I th I think that's it, right? That's just about it. Yeah, that's I, it. I, I guess. If, Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, I think you were going to say what I was going to say, so go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, we really appreciate all of you who came by for this stream and shared your thoughts with us. Of course, there are other ways you can share your thoughts with us as well. Um, we have a Facebook page, uh, which we will begin providing this information in uh, chat. Actually, Google, you go ahead and sound it all off. I'll type it all out. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, we have a Facebook page, as we just mentioned. We also have a Twitter, at CIM underscore CCG. Feel free to follow us there as we do announce all of our streams there. Uh, well, almost all of them. I think we've forgotten once or twice, but we're, we're getting better at that. And uh, you can, uh, we have a presence on the Reddit. We announce all our streams there as well. And yeah, I think that's about it, right? Reddit, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah, that sounds right. Oh, email. Yes. Uh, you can email us at. Uh, Commentary is magic team at gmail.com. You know, that thing that everyone has an email address. Let us know your thoughts. Um, share your opinions on the stream, suggestions for future streams, content you'd like us to cover. Let us know if you like these deck discourse series. We yeah. have a lot of fun with them. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And also, um, uh, you might notice uh, Fluttershy at the bottom there. These streams, uh, you know, bandwidth is not free. Uh, recording equipment is not free, and uh, every little bit helps. If you can uh, donate, we would very much appreciate it. We we do love uh, talking about uh, 
everything we talk about, whether it's a deck or archetypes or meta commentary or whatever. Like, we love doing this. We're going to do this no matter what, but it does cost money. Sometimes like, we like talking about it for too long. Sure. Sometimes. Like right now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, with that, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, we were glad to have you all here. I am, as always, Grand Paws. I am Emperor Buell. Big Cheese. Arcat and... Leo the Living Silver. And we will see you all in about a week. Bye. Well, depending on where you are. You get the idea. Bye. Bye-bye.